Hello all and welcome to another Stingray Tom's Florida video. Today I'll be looking at 10 amazing historic buildings that aren't as well known as they should be, but are all very interesting to visit. A few on this list are attractions in their own right, but they're all historically important and excellent examples of their styles. Maybe none of them would make the typical top 10 list of Florida buildings because they're hidden gems in out of the way locations around the state. Enjoy! Florida Historic Building No. 1, the Marjorie Kennan Rawlings Homestead. Located at Marjorie Kennan Rawlings Historic State Park near the small community of Cross Creek, this early homestead was owned by the remarkable writer who told stories about Florida cracker life and had a life worthy of a novel herself. Her frame-built one-story homestead served as the backdrop for her novels and her memoirs. Rawlings, who was born in 1896, was a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and chronicler of Florida rural life. With books such as Cross Creek and The Yearling, she helped introduce Florida to a national audience. Purchasing the property in 1928, it was her home until 1941 when she purchased a beach house, though she never sold the farm. It was bequeathed to the University of Florida and today is part of the state park system. The park is only about 8 acres or 3 hectares in size, but it's adjacent to much larger public lands including La Cusa and Orange Lakes. Much of the adjacent land was part of Rawlings original property. The house was built in the 1800s, but it was added to several times. The original part is a dog trot style house, common in Florida in the 19th century. Dog trots are built with a large breezeway set between the rooms. Often both sides have two rooms and there is usually a wide porch at the front and back. The breezeway helps cool the house during Florida's hot and humid summers. While Rawlings added rooms to the house and modernized it, that modernization ended in the late 30s and visitors can see what the house looked like prior to World War II. Even the furniture is hers. It was returned to the house many years after Rawlings' death by a friend who had inherited it. The house was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1970. While Rawlings didn't consider herself a regional writer, nearly all her stories from the 30s and 40s were about life in Florida. As such, she became the voice of an era between the two wars when rural life was little impacted by the rest of the country. Florida Historic Building No. 2 The Old Christ Church in Pensacola Located within the Seville Historic District in Pensacola, the Old Christ Church is a Gothic Revival structure built by the Episcopal community and starting in 1830. With the exception of the Cathedral at St. Augustine, it is the oldest church built in Florida that is still standing. It is made of brick that was manufactured in the area and is a moderately sized church with a bell tower which also serves as the main entrance to the sanctuary. The interior is beautifully finished with honey-colored wood pews and an exposed rafter system supporting the roof. During the Civil War, it was used by federal forces as barracks in a hospital. The Episcopal congregation moved out of it in 1903, and it was eventually deeded to the city of Pensacola in 1936, which used it as a public library until 1957. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1964, and the Pensacola Historical Museum was established in the church in 1960. It's currently one of the many buildings that comprise the historic Pensacola Village, which is managed by the University of West Florida Historic Trust. It's shown as part of their regular tours. While it no longer operates as a church, it's available for weddings and other functions. Florida Historic Building Number 3 the Clewiston Inn. Built by the U.S. Sugar Company in 1926, the Clewiston Inn was designed to be a centerpiece of the new town. Created as a planned city for the workers of the largest sugar mill in the world, Clewiston needed a hotel that would cater to company officials, politicians, and other business leaders. Designed in the classical revival style by architects Clark and Wortman, 
It features two stories, a tall front portico, and arch windows on the ground floor. Sustaining a lot of damage from a 1938 fire, it was rebuilt and eventually placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1991. Clewiston has been the center of Florida's sugar industry for about a hundred years, and indeed, the Clewiston Inn has filled the role of the centerpiece of the town and continues to be a significant building in the center of the city, looking across the town's green towards U.S. Sugar's corporate offices. It's still the place to stay in the South Lake Okeechobee region. Florida Historic Building Number 4, the Rogers Building in Orlando. Known early on as the English Club, the Rogers Building is an eclectic two-story structure located in downtown Orlando. Built by the English immigrant Gordon Rogers in 1886, it's considered the oldest building in Orlando, a city that actually has quite a few excellent examples of architectural styles from the 1880s through the Depression era. The English Club, which was located on the second floor, was organized for the many English immigrants that were arriving in the 1880s and 1890s and who helped to develop the young community and make it the center of citrus production in the state. The Rogers Building is of the Queen Anne Revival style, a type of American Victorian design that typically includes an asymmetrical facade, towers, and highly decorative exterior wall treatments. In the case of the Rogers Building, it's covered in pressed zinc metal tiles that were imported from England. It also has heavily embossed friezes and other detailed features. It's the only surviving wood frame building in Orlando's downtown business district, and it's considered one of the most distinctive late 19th century buildings in the state. The building was renovated in 2000 and was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1983. Florida Historic Building Number 5, The Ormond House. One of the few remaining antebellum plantation houses in Florida, Ormond House was an important part of Apalachicola life for nearly 100 years. Built in 1838 for Thomas and Sarah Ormond, the Federal and Greek Revival House is one of the most important in Apalachicola history. Located just north of the city and within sight of the Apalachicola River, the property sits on a bluff that would have given it a commanding view of the river and surrounding area. Thomas, who was born in 1799, was from New York. Sarah Love Tripp was from Georgia. The two married somewhere around the time that Thomas moved to New Orleans in 1820. By 1834, they had moved their family to Apalachicola while Thomas was developing a mercantile business. Located at the mouth of the Apalachicola River, it was a boomtown. Steamboats filled with cotton from the interior of Georgia and Alabama would stop at the docks of the young city and transfer their cargo to ocean-going ships bound for New England and Europe. The house began as a two-story wooden structure with porches on both levels looking out on the river. The original structure contained only four rooms, a parlor and dining room downstairs and two bedrooms upstairs. These were divided by the staircase. The kitchen was located in an outbuilding. The house has elements of both Federal and Greek Revival architecture, with seven squared columns supporting the two porches, as well as wooden mantelpieces, molded plaster cornices, and carved bas-relief magnolia blossoms. Wide pine floorboards complete the design. As time passed and the family prospered, more rooms were added, including a portion that ran across the entire rear of the house and an additional bedroom on the second floor. The most obvious addition, at least to the look of the front facade, was an office built in the ground floor porch. That would be built in the early 1900s. The outbuildings included a kitchen, sheds, outhouses, and shacks that were used as slave quarters. Up to 25 slaves worked in the house and the gardens until freed during the Civil War. Unlike the cotton plantations upriver, the Ormond slave holdings were modest, though they enabled the family to live in prosperity and luxury. One of the buildings used as slave quarters still stands on the property. Thomas and Sarah's granddaughter, Sadie Orman, married John Fenimore Cooper Griggs, a circuit court judge and customs agent. They took possession of Orman House in 1896. Sadie became the third generation Orman to call the place her home, and it was then that the office on the porch was built. In 1994, it was sold out of the Orman family and operated as a bed and breakfast. 
The state purchased it in 2001 and made it into a state park. It's part of the Apalachicola Historic District, even though it's not on the National Register of Historic Places itself. Florida Historic Building Number 6, the Live Oak Union Depot. The Live Oak Union Passenger Depot was built in 1909. It served four rail lines, the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad, the Seaboard Airline Railroad, the Florida Railway Company, and the Live Oak, Perry, and Gulf Railroad Company. The depot was constructed in the masonry vernacular style with Romanesque revival elements. It's made of brick and is one and a half stories tall. The last passenger service occurred in 1971, and afterwards the depot sat vacant. In 1994, the nonprofit organization Pride in Action bought the depot and had it relocated. The passenger depot was originally on the opposite side of the Atlantic Coast Line freight station. After it moved to the north side of the freight depot, the Suwannee County Historical Commission took possession. In 2006, it was transferred to the Suwannee County Board of Commissioners and renovations were completed in 2011. Both depots were put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. The freight station is run by the Suwannee County Historical Commission and contains a history museum with a nice collection of interesting artifacts. Three of the museum's more interesting exhibits are the Telephone Exchange Office, the Large Moonshine Still, and the collection of artifacts from Africa. Florida Historic Building Number 7, All Saints Episcopal Church in Enterprise. This tiny carpenter's Gothic Revival church was built in 1883. It's a one-story wood frame structure with steeply sloping roofs and board and batson siding running vertically. Its windows are deeply pointed at their top and contain stained glass. The interior is finished with wood, including open rafters. It was constructed of Florida longleaf and curly pine and bald cypress. It stands today little change from its original form as it had only two additions, a small sacristy built on the rear in the 1950s and a front porch and ramp that was added in 1971. It was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1974. This attractive church comes from the time when Enterprise was an active port on the St. Johns River and the seat of Volusia County. It was the second time Enterprise was a county seat. In 1843, Enterprise became the seat of Mosquito County. Mosquito was more appropriately renamed Orange County in 1845. A new Episcopalian congregation was formed in 1881, which would meet in Jacob Brock's parlor until the church building was completed. Beginning in 1851, the development of the town of Enterprise was in large part the creation of Brock, who built a hotel for wealthy northern hunters and anglers. That same year, Enterprise became the seat of the newly formed Volusia County. Brock's hotel patrons would take a steamboat out of Jacksonville, down to St. John's to Lake Monroe. It was a more than 200-mile or 322-kilometer trip that took nearly two full days, though for part of the trip it was only safe to navigate the narrow, shallow, and curving upper St. John's River during the day. Enterprise and Sanford, its sister city on the other side of the lake, were the end of the line for the steamboats. That's why even today there are no towns further up to St. John's. Florida Historic Building Number 8 the Old Sopchoppy High School Gymnasium. The Sopchoppy High School Gymnasium is one of the more unusual buildings on this list, and as it was built in 1939, it's the youngest. Constructed of local limestone, it's considered to be in the masonry vernacular style with Spanish mission elements, and was designed by the architect James Stripling. It's a one-story building that was primarily constructed by labor from the Great Depression-era government agency, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. The building has an interesting exterior of a regularly shaped limestone that was finished with a flattened surface, creating a unique look in Florida architecture. There are two entryways at the corners of the front facade with curved arched doorways and windows. Both the front and rear facades have high walls that hide the standard peaked roof that covers the main central part of the building. The windows on the gym sides are rectangular, and there are two fireplaces on the building sides, one on the right front and one on the left rear. The chimneys are finished with the same limestone exterior treatment. 
The gym was one of the last buildings constructed for the school. The oldest buildings date as early as 1924, although large parts of the main school building, including several classrooms and the auditorium, were also built by the WPA in the late 1930s, using local labor and craftsmen. The gym is noted for its 18 to 20 inch or 45 to 50 centimeter thick limestone walls. The gym was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1990 and was renovated in 1998. Florida Historic Building Number 9, the House of Refuge on Hutchinson Island. Easily the most intriguing name on the list, the House of Refuge at Gilbert's Bar has an even more intriguing story. This is the only remaining rescue station operated by the U.S. Life Saving Service, a precursor of the U.S. Coast Guard. Built in 1876, the House of Refuge is Martin County's oldest building. Located on Hutchinson Island, just north of the Stewart Inlet, it was built at one of the narrowest parts of any of Florida's barrier islands. At high tide, the island is less than 200 feet or 61 meters wide. The House of Refuge is a unique survivor of a bygone age. It was one of 10 stations operating along the coast of Florida to shelter shipwrecked sailors. Five houses were constructed on the East Coast in 1876, with five more added by 1886. Like the other nine, this house was built of Florida pine with clabbered siding and was surrounded by a covered veranda. The lower floor was divided into four rooms with the kitchen at the north end. There was also a dining room, living room, and at the south end, a bedroom. The house was staffed by a keeper and his family. The attic was designed as a dormitory for shipwrecked sailors. It was equipped with 20 cots, dried and salted provisions to feed 20 men for 10 days, chests of medicines, and books. A brick cistern collected rain from the roof of the house to supply drinking water. A second building held two lifeboats, though the house wasn't designed for rescuing shipwrecked sailors. Its mission was to keep sailors safe and healthy until transportation off the island could be arranged. From 1915 to 1940, the house was a Coast Guard station, and during World War II, it was used by the U.S. Navy for beach patrol and submarine lookout. Only 10 years after the war, the Historical Society of Martin County took it over. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1974. It currently operates as a historical museum that tells its story as well as the history of the life-saving service. It also has displays about the Stewart area. The adjacent lookout tower is the youngest structure on the property. It was built during World War II. The House of Refuge is an interesting museum to visit. Its history is unique and dramatic. The property rests on the Atlantic shore. It's an area informally known to locals as the Rocks for the ancient Anastasia Rock Formation, one of only a few places in the state with a rocky coastline. Florida Historic Building Number 10, the Asa May House. Located in Caps, an unincorporated community in Jefferson County, just north of the intersection of U.S. Routes 19 and 27, the Asa May House is an early example of a Florida plantation house. Built around 1836 and designed in the Greek Revival style, it's an excellent representation of the smaller cotton plantation homes that once dotted North Florida. It's a raised, one-and-a-half-story wood frame structure with a gable roof and porch that runs the full width of the front facade. That porch is supported by six columns, and there are three dormers above to provide light and air to the bedrooms. The house also has a large brick fireplace on each side. At a later point, an extension to the house was built perpendicular to the rear facade. It originally had its kitchen in an outbuilding and there's evidence that its structural members of Florida pine and bald cypress were logged and milled on the site. The house was built for Burwell McBride, a transplant from South Carolina. Asa May was given the house after his marriage to McBride's granddaughter, Margaret. Asa May owned the 3,500-acre Rosewood Cotton Plantation, and this house was the centerpiece. It's currently in private hands, and the adjacent property is a pine forest. It was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1972. And a bonus, a Florida historic boat, the African Queen. 
used as one of the two boats in the 1955 movie The African Queen. This is one of the few items on the National Register of Historic Places that isn't a place. Built in England in 1912, she is a 30-foot or 9-meter open-hulled steam launch built out of galvanized steel. She was built by the Litham Shipbuilding and Engineering Company in Litham, St. Anne's, Lancashire. Originally named the Livingston, she was built for the British East Africa Railway. She operated on the Ruki River, a tributary of the Congo River in what was the northern part of the Belgian Congo, known today as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Her job was to transport hunters, missionaries, mercenaries, and general cargo into the interior of the continent. Rechristened the African Queen, she was used for the filming of the movie in the same area it had been working, near the Congo River, and returned to her former service after the film was completed. In the 1970s, she was found in Egypt and was transported to the U.S., eventually making her way to the Florida Keys. She's currently owned by a trust and was refurbished in 2012 for her 100th birthday. The Queen was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1992, and today she operates as a tour boat in Key Largo. Well, that's about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. I'd appreciate it. Stingray Toms, Florida traveling through time around the Sunshine State.